those of you who started the journey with me from the beginning, when we started in the second chapter, we started back at message number one, so this would be message number six of the second chapter of Colossians. Now, last the last two weeks, we took a look at some of the man-made traditions that are and have permeated the church, both Catholic and Protestant. But from the body of this letter, we can glean at least seven things that have the potential to carry people away, which is why Paul uses the word rooted and grounded, basically, in the faith. You have to be entrenched. But he speaks of the first thing, philosophy. Not not that Paul is against education or learning, but it is very clear as we get into these verses that are coming that the folks who came to Colossae, who are the false teachers, philosophy simply, philosophia, the love of wisdom. There's nothing wrong with the love of wisdom or, or filling your mind with knowledge, but if it is in, in a contrary way to the gospel, if it is trying to say you must go with the world's wisdom versus God's wisdom, there is a problem right there. Any humanistic ideologies. So you've, you've got this kind of complex word that can carry a lot with it, but look at what's attached to it. Philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, which is what we've been, what we've spent the last two weeks looking at uh, human rules and religion, world encroachment, world principles, before the principles of faith in Christ that are contrary to the gospel. We'll also encounter in the, the verses coming up what will clearly be an understanding of whoever came to Colossae was probably trying to say Christ plus Moses plus the law. So other things that will basically make a shipwreck of your faith or mine, things that I'm I'm kind of itemizing out of the second chapter would be legalism, a demand for observing certain practices regarding food, Uh, as I mentioned, like fish on Friday. Uh, I know lots of people were very happy about that. Or abstaining from drink. You know, there are people that will tell you, if you're a Christian, you ought to not take any type of alcohol. Every drunk knows what the Apostle Paul wrote, take a little wine for the stomach's sake, and they call Jesus a wine-bibber. So methinks that Jesus partook joyfully too. I'm not saying that one should indulge or overindulge, but don't, eat, don't try to make it something that God never spoke about and never said, don't do this. The observance of man-made holidays, which I basically spent a little time on last week. And lastly, what I would call probably the worst offender, which is not listed in here per se, but when he says about the worshiping of angels and other things, I want you to think of something that has hurt the church really badly, say in the last 50 years, and more specifically and intensely in the last 30 years, would be New Age ideas that are implemented, grafted in. And, and when I say New Age, don't, don't think it's something way out there. A lot of things that are said, specifically in today's mainstream Media make basically will try to make every religion and every religious belief basically it all comes back to the same. You heard, I'm sure you've heard people say it's all kind of the same, isn't it? You ever heard somebody say that to you? It's all kind of the same. Well, it's not all kind of the same because Buddha didn't lay down his life and die and be raised up again, and neither did Muhammad. And I can go through all the religious leaders that founders of the faith, not one of them. So don't say it's all the same, but that is a new age mindset. You've also heard me use that million dollar word syncretism where we just kind of blend everything together. So a lot of times people will have doctrines and they are difference of doctrines. Some of them are not that, we'll call it damning, and others the difference in doctrines is night and day. So there's another danger, which is, t- it's in here, but not verbatim, which is what I've called pseudo-gospel, the imitation. And that is rampant today. You've got a lot of people out there who, here come the air quotes, preach the gospel, but really it's a pseudo-gospel. 
There's never a mention of blood. There's never a mention of sacrifice. There's never a mention of death and dying. In fact, the, the things that if we as Christians, as Christian ministers are bringing the gospel, there's something that's going to happen to the folks who are listening, who God's prepared their soul and their mind to receive. And I'll give you just one. I've said this before. I'll give you just one example. You'll know that I keep saying the same thing. I'm saying the same thing I said 10 years ago. If people are being instructed in this book and getting to know Jesus Christ, right? I've said many times, how do you get to know someone? You what? You spend time with him. You spend time with God in his word, learning about him. Something, just one something I'm going to point out. Your view on death and dying is going to change. It doesn't mean that you're going to look at death and dying and be, I can't wait. But you're going to come to a place of gnosis. I know that I know that I know death is not the end. You know, our world would like to tell you, press in because when the end comes, it's all over. The Apostle Paul himself, when he was writing about himself, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. And that Greek word, analusios, is used for a ship just getting started, not a ship that's coming in that will never go out again, but one that's just getting started, its maiden journey or voyage. So the importance of preaching the gospel, and I just used one example, that you know when somebody has received and their understanding because their understanding of this life, the gift of this life, and then ultimately death and dying have changed. Death Where is your sting? For the Christian, that really becomes a reality. Now, there are people, when they start off, they may be a little unsure of this thing, but the more time you spend with Christ in this book, the more time it becomes clear. He came out of the grave. We're not talking about some fantasy. We're not talking about this. As I've said many times in my Easter message, the Apostle Paul He didn't have to make up a story. All the other disciples may have had to make up a story to cover up the fact that they followed and bet on the wrong horse, that Jesus wasn't really who he was. But Paul wasn't even in that circle, so why keep propagating a lie? Saying he had an encounter on the Damascus Road, that he was changed, he was blinded. When his eyes were open, this zealous Jew is now on fire for Christ. So something from my understanding, and I believe from this book, ought to be stirring in the hearts and minds of people as they receive. Now, that that does come with time. And what Paul was trying to caution these folks here, be careful that no one carries you away as spoil. And when I say, you know, Paul's giving the warning to these folks, I've been standing and trying to give a warning to anyone who will listen to me of just how easy it is to get carried away with wrong doctrine. And I'm not saying to you, oh, Melissa Scott has all the answers. I've never said that to you. What I am saying is there is a difference in, if I see something in here, and I've said this before, if it is something that either contradicts what I have spoken publicly or it is in in alignment with the word, but I've said something differently. There's no place for ego. I must come and I must tell you, this is what it says. So if we're going to be treating the word in this way, it's necessary for us to look at why exactly, what exactly, the the dangers that I've mentioned, they're all great. But then when we get into verses 9 through 15, you will see clearly that Paul basically is beginning an extended meditation on Christ's nature, and he's showing the Colossians they must take care to not be led astray. I wish, I wish I could take this message and bring it to the masses everywhere. Why? Because I believe most of the masses are misled, unfortunately. It doesn't take much. You know, if you think about it, each and every one of us was brought up in a home where either our mother or father or grandparents may have, we either stayed the course, but most of the people I talk to, usually it'll be uh, one half of the family was like this and one half like that. They may have all been, for example, Catholics, but not practicing, only by name. I know many people where there's this imbalance. But 
the bottom line is how can you protect yourself from being carried away if you are not receiving sound doctrine and if you're not staying in the word and if you're not checking out what the pastor is saying. So for the Colossians, at verse 9, which I will read, begins to kind of fortify his polemic, his, basically it's a plea to these people to wake up because you're going in the wrong direction. You're listening to the wrong thing. So he says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, isn't this like, does not, does this verse not sound like what he said earlier? For it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. That was verse 19 of the first chapter. What's added here is the word bodily. So I want to talk about this verse. I was going to do some translation, and I thought, no, we're just going to talk about this, and I think I can explain and give some clarity to this. So the first word I want to look at in this verse, no translation. I'll talk it out so that I bring everybody along with me. In verse 9, the word for Godhead. Now, what's interesting is this word appears, for example, in the book of Romans, Godhead. But etymologically, they are two different words. So the word that is appearing here versus the word that appears, so Colossians versus Romans. If we were trying to, because I have to kind of give this understanding. So the word that appears in, in Romans would be, Godhead as well in English, but would translate to the equivalent of divinity, and the word in Colossians, Godhead, would translate what would be tantamount to deity. Now, do not think that these things actually have the same value. They do not. We could say that every, every man, and when I use the word man, it's generic humankind, every man may have divinity within them, that is, God's deposit in them, but no man possesses deity. Now, this is a, it's a gray area in my explanation because we could say, well, what about the fact that the Holy Spirit's in you? Still not. No human being has the possession of deity within them. They may have divinity, that is, the divine nature. So when we talk about Godhead, it's important to understand these two words are separate and distinct, and the word we're looking at when Paul in verse 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. He's speaking of the deity. And he, he's, what he's saying is it's not a portion or partial, not even a manifestation in part of the divine nature, but the fullness. Go back and read it again. All the fullness of the deity. If you kind of put that somewhere in the margin, it, it actually, you know, when you read Godhead, for me, that kind of brings up the word maybe triune or trinity, but the implication is deity. So in him, all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. I just reversed the order a little bit to make it clear. Now, this becomes important for us in Paul's argument because now we begin to see what these false teachers might have been planting in the ears of those people at Colossae. First and foremost, the need for him to repeat at first chapter 1 and verse 19 and then again here, and it'll be repeated again elsewhere in this book, grabs my attention. The word fullness, which we know... We know that the folks, if they were of a Gnostic bent, this would have been, this word fullness, would have been a word tossed around very easily. See, the Gnostics would have this kind of idea that here is Christ and he is less. We need to add something here. So we have this secret knowledge of things. I've seen people do this, unfortunately, in our day and age where they try to give you the impression that they possess secret knowledge of things not revealed to anybody else. Ever met anybody like that? <laughs> ah. All right. <laughs> Sorry, but, you know, if, if you think you got a special message, you might be special. <laughs> 
So what I'm saying here is this word, fullness, which the Greek word, pleroma. He is the pleroma of the deity, the fullness of the deity, and we, by virtue of that, receive the plerosis. So he, he is the entire entity, the entire fullness of God. We receive his plerosis. Uh, I just introduced two words that may not make sense right now, but in the coming weeks, they'll make more sense as we go because these verses, 9 through 15, are kind of all woven together, so I can't just treat them separately. The emphasis that Paul is trying to make here is that if all the fullness of the deity lived inside and was and still is in Christ, then everything that you and I need salvifically or salvation, everything that we need, why you can go to Philippians, my God shall supply all your need. All that we need is in Christ. So these people were coming and saying, well, you need something else. This is always the way people mislead other people by telling you that you're lacking something. So Paul's argument here is that everything that you need, and the key word added, the difference between 119 and 29 in Colossians, is that addition of bodily, which is speaking of something really plain and simple. The incarnate Christ had all of the possession of the deity. And I must clarify to say that if he possessed all the fullness, do not think that God, for example, the Father, was empty at any time. It's just saying that as he came in the flesh, as he walked in the flesh, but more importantly, the word dwelleth is in the present, which means as he was and continues to be even as he is sat down by the right hand of the Father, continues to be. Why? Because he's coming back, and the fullness of that deity will be returning all in all, not just, you know, I <laughs> left a part there and bring a little part with me, the whole person of Christ returning. Now, if we understand what this means for us, a complete Christ makes his people complete. In other words, our understanding, and this is an important thing. You may think this kind of sounds a little bit like rhetoric, but it's not. Your understanding of who Christ is and your relationship to him is incredibly important. Most people don't stop to think about that. But however you see Christ, well, let's put it this way. If you have limitations on your understanding of Christ, these will be the limitations of your understanding, your ability to wrap your mind around with limitations. And most people who I met who, who even study the Bible are still in that limited mindset. So it's important that we get clarity. First, the argument for Paul is that all you need, there's no Jesus plus something else. All you need, and I did this before when I taught out of 119, now, if you go back into the Old Testament and you start looking at all the names of God that appear, you know, this church is very rich in teaching on this because we've done the names of God so many times. But if you go through and you realize it's almost like the colors of a rainbow, when we encounter God, for example, in Genesis as El Shaddai, the, the breasted one or the sufficient one, or El Elyon, or El Olam, the God, the everlasting God. I could go through all the names, all the Jehovah names. When they said, who should I say sent me? Say I am, which becomes Yahweh, which we then take, that becomes Jehovah, that becomes Jehovah with names attached, like Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, or the Lord who sees, Jehovah Ra, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. These are names of God revealed through the whole book. You get into the New Testament and you find that names like Emmanuel, God with us, they all are telling us something about God's nature. But when we talk about the fullness of the deity dwelling in him, do not think it is just mere portions of manifestation, but the full totality. Now, let's keep going here because you're going to start to see a pattern and it's, it's not subtle at all. 
Now, take a look at the words for in him. Go to verse 10, and you are complete in him, in whom also, buried with him. So the highlight of this book will be union with Christ, in him, in him, in him. It's as if Paul, one track mind, almost line by line, is he's reminding them with each part of the argument to get them to understand they may be going in the wrong direction, union with Christ, being in him. That's all that Paul needed. Remember, Paul was a zealous Jew, right? Gets converted on the Damascus Road. So he knew all of the, we'll call them the the ceremonial parts of Judaism, that now suddenly it's faith only. So it's important for us, for the, we'll we'll say the continuance of the modern-day church, these verses become paramount to understand. We don't need anything else. If you are coming into the church and you think, well, I need Jesus, but I also need these other things, then you're looking for something other than Jesus. Let me say that again. You're not looking for Jesus. You're not looking to know who God is from the book, from, from the spirit, from these revelations. You're looking to basically anthropomorphize, make God into an image that is more human, that you can basically lower down to your level and then have this relationship on this level here, not where God intended it, which is he is perfect and I am not. So these are the problems, and I think the big thing here is that everything depends on what you or I think of Christ. Now, there's a place in the Bible in the New Testament the question is asked, what think ye of Christ? That was someone asking somebody else, but I'm asking you. I'm asking you who already believe, who already have faith, what do you think of Christ? Is Christ, and this is not meant for you to answer, it's something rhetorical. If he is the sufficiency of our faith and the sufficiency of our salvation, then please tell me why we've added so many things that don't belong. And then we go take it one step further. Those things that we've added become more important or they become just as important on par with. Now, how do you think God sees all of that when he sent his only begotten son to die? He had already, in the Old Testament, given all of these prescriptions of ceremonies and offerings and sacrifices and we'll call it all the different hoops that people had to jump through. And now he says, and this is the way now. So how... Much of an affront is it to God when we start adding because it just couldn't be enough. The simplicity of what is offered, and I say that, forgive me for trying to clarify, but the simplicity is not as simple as we might make it. Simplicity that all we need is faith, but as you start probing, you realize there's great depth to this matter that I can't just blow right by. Now, the next thing that I would like to talk about here between verses 9 and 10, when he says, and you are complete in him. Now, let me try and put this in a different way. Why then, if, if Christ is all we need, now let's talk about the modern church. If you're complete in him, why have we basically... Almost every church in every age has basically said, by their acts, not by necessarily their words, but by their acts, Christ is not enough. Okay? To the people who are into works, no, no, you need to, you know, you need to go out and do good deeds. Otherwise, you know, you, you're, you can't be saved. This is not true. But when it says, and ye are complete in him, what Paul is pointing out to these people there. You don't need anything else. I'm going to keep repeating myself until it becomes clear even to us who are in the sanctuary, you who are listening to me wherever you are. If we kind of start understanding, the minute these people lessened Christ, think about this. If you lessen the deity of Christ, you're also saying that, wait for it, your forgiveness and all the, we'll call them the benefits, all the things that Christ have done, they also have to be lessened. Does that make sense? So you tell me how you'd like to approach this because the minute you start adding, now put this into modern application, the minute you start adding things 
And I've met people, I'm guilty of this myself early on, thinking there's got to be something else I have to do. There must be something. This is, it, it's too easy to just say, well, I, I faith, I, I read the promises, I'm praying, I'm doing all this. It's too easy. There must be something more. Well, and that's where the mind of humankind comes in to say, yeah, well, you know, you can add this into your spirituality and you can add this and we can do these practices and suddenly all of those things become the focus. This is what I was trying to say regarding the Catholic Church. It's not that I think anything is inherently bad, but when all of these functions begin to substitute the main essence, and as I said, Protestants are just as guilty. Think about how many times I have talked about this, the problem that we have, which is people who either do not see the implications of lessening Christ and adding anything, adding anything at all is basically saying he died in vain. You don't think that there's something wrong with that? Because I do. Now, the divine fullness is the fountainhead of all truth. So if Paul is trying to drive people back to Christ, and kind, it's almost like if you've ever seen sheep or cows, cattle, anything that are being rounded up, you'll always have this mindset within the church, and it's just the way it is. People will go around what, what I call the, the popular paddocks, the popular food, the stuff that's easy and safe, but you get them into a territory where, you know, familiarity is not so much there and they have to completely depend on God and suddenly this idea of walking by faith and doing all this simple, what, what is asked of me becomes a scary thing. Why? Because the rest of the sheep are doing other things. Me thinks I should be in there doing other things with them instead of doing the thing that God wants me to do. So it's almost a very big circular argument. But when you come back to it, now I'm going to read into verse 11, but I'm not really going, going to do a whole lot with it today because there's a lot to talk about, and I want to save that for next Sunday or future Sunday, when he says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So it becomes clear from 9, 10, and 11 that there are things that these folks, these false teachers, are expecting the believers at Colossae to do. Now, why does he have to mention you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ? Why? Because the folks that came, the folks that came to Colossae were Jews, but they were not Judaizers. Jews that came to Galatia were Judaizers. These, these folks that came, this is why he's mentioning circumcision here. They were Jews, but they were more philosopher Jews than they were Judaizers. They weren't trying to convert people back to Judaism or Christ plus Judaism. They came with great philosophic ideas to explain and also this mystic Gnosticism. So in combination... Be very easy if you were near someone who said they possess some special knowledge that's not in any written or oral tradition, and you didn't have a clarity of what Paul's saying, you'd probably want to listen. You'd be curious enough, curious enough to listen, and probably these folks had enough power of persuasion that what they were saying sounded very plausible. Now, do you think that's only a problem in Colossae? say, 2,000 years ago or less than 2,000 years ago? Because I don't. I think it's a problem that still exists rampantly today, except we're not, most are not looking for this. We just accept the fact that these things have crept in, and whether it is somebody saying they have secret knowledge, and those people I'd say just stay away from them, or those people who would like to tell you, yes, Jesus, but you also need to do these other things. And we'll talk about it, and I'm, I'm actually very anxious to get into talking about some things that I think even many Christians that I meet are confused about, which is what to do with the law of Moses. And I meet Protestants, and believe it or not, I meet Catholics. I meet people who think that we are still under the law, 
that some portion of the law, not just the Ten Commandments, I've told you the law isn't the Ten Commandments, it's 316 do's and don'ts, when clearly, repeatedly, and it's the Jew, Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul, the heralder of the Christian faith, who's saying the handwriting of ordinances has been abolished. So it's important for us to take in all of this and understand we can be led astray in many ways. Sometimes we don't even know that we're being led astray. I also read into these verses something else. If we can deduce from just 9, 10, and 11 and the rest of the letter we've already covered, the false teachers deemed Christ to be insufficient. If we kind of look at what they might have tried to substitute, they might have maybe tried to substitute the fact that uh, because it says about these the worshiping of angels, it might be that they tried to tell the people there Christ, but Christ is not the only one who possesses all the understanding of the unseen world. Therefore, you've got these beings called angels, and we ought to venerate and worship them. It's a very subtle thing if you're not understanding what's being said. So a few questions I'd like to talk about here which I think will help us and sort out a little bit of what's going on here. You know, many places in the Bible talk about things that Christ did for us. For example, 1 Peter, it says, he bore our sins, right? And I know there's people out there in, in in the listening audience, he bore our sins in his own body. Stop and think about something. As I just said, all the fullness of the deity dwells in him, And we know that God sent the deposit of the spirit, Erebone, into our hearts. So try this mindset with me for a minute. If he bore our sins in his own body, that means sins that I committed uh, 2,000 years after his death and present and those yet to come were placed on him, then a dimension of my sinfulness, even though it's not a dimension of my goodness or my saintliness, but a dimension of my sinliness, or however you want to phrase that, was placed on him. Do you ever stop to think that if a dimension of my being, even the negative part, was placed on him, and he is in me, or his nature by the Spirit is in me, there is a union beyond just the simple words. Now, what I just said, probably half the people listening may be like, so what? (laughs) Or a big deal. But actually, I want you to itemize it, make it specific to you. Imagine you for you, not, not me speaking for you, but each person in the sound of my voice thinking about the fact that when we say, and I'll, I'll say it for me, you've got to kind of think about it for you. My sins were laid on him. Now, the confusion here is, well, how could my sins be laid on him 2,000 years ago when I'm alive? In this day and age, and I wasn't living when he was alive. Well, it continues. The efficacy of his salvation for me continues to this day, including my forgiveness. But that means a dimension of my sinning person. My sins were placed on him. His nature is given to me. That means there is is a union there. There is a proximity there beyond words, beyond imagination, beyond even comprehension. Now, if we really believe in that unity, it should change the way we relate to him. Now, I'm not talking to unbelievers. Now, I'm talking to believers. In our, in our book right here, in 122, it says back there, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameable, the things that he did for me. And I think when I start to think about what's being said here, it's a little bit more personal. It has a little bit more depth for me when I start to really understand some dimension of me, and it's, it's not the good part of me either, it was placed on him. He bore my sins. And some wonderful dimension of his nature was given to me. It's kind of a really, if you think about it, it's not a very good deal for him at least, Right? He's getting my junk and I'm getting his gold. Kind of like that, right? But that's the way you have to think of it. That union 
then has to be clarified in understanding. If all the fullness, if every part of the dimension, not mere vignettes of manifestation, as I said, I could go through the names of God and say they're all containing him, but that would mislead people to think that they are the slivers of the manifestation versus the real substance of the deity in him, which means I started down this pathway. The prosperity folks also brought in something when they were preaching prosperity that got lost, that a lot of people just lumped in with prosperity, but that is healing, that God is a healer. You know what the tragedy is? The tragedy is there are more things in the Bible where we see God, old and new, touching in different dimensions, healing his people. When it says that he led them out of Egypt's bondage and there wasn't a feeble one in their midst. Or whether it was where he sweetened the water and he said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Or whether it was Jesus touching Peter's mother-in-law's hand and raising her up from a fever. They took the prosperity and then they, they morphed the healing part into some other prosperity when in fact healing is in the atonement and this concept of all the fullness of God, all the deity bodily means that when I look to him, there is everything that I need. And I, I highlighted healing because I, when I addressed this last week, I kind of glossed over it, and then I thought, no, I should mention this. There are people that are very confused about this. Now, if we're understanding the text aright, Paul is basically saying, whatever it is you need. That's not the license to say, God, I need a Rolls Royce, and I need a fat bank account. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, Lord, I need guidance. I need wisdom. I need clarification. I need understanding. I need patience. Lord, I need help. That he's able to do. That he's promised to do. He is God with us. So these are the important things. Now, let me just take one more sidebar and say the church is supposed to be Christocentric. That means that everything focuses on, and we may have differences. And I'm clarifying something I said, I believe, last week. We may have differences, for example, the difference between Calvinists and Arminians. And I didn't say Armenians. And the difference between the two, but nonetheless, we're talking about interpretation of Christ and his work. Now, there may be people who are of the Calvinistic bent or of the Armenian bent, but nevertheless, we're talking about interpretation. We're not talking about highlighting another person other than Christ. And recognizing the difference between theological differences like that versus being instructed whether you pray to Jesus Christ or praying to another person, for example, like Mary. These are the important parts to understand where we do have differences and what they are, and as long as they're Christocentric. I can respect another scholar who does not have the same understanding as long as the, the center of the message still looks to Christ. That's not what was happening with these folks that came. So this is the danger. The next part of this, as I've said, becomes a little bit easier as you go. If we take the next verse, in whom you're also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, it's saying that Christ has done something in you that the law of circumcision could not do. Now, again, I've, I've had so many people write and ask me about this that I almost feel like, as I said, a whole message will suffice. But the one thing that I can tell you is the, the rebuttal here coming from the pen of a one-time zealous Jew. This is what gives the authenticity and the, what I'd call the, the substance to Paul's writing, is to go from, it's a radical turn from what you've been brought up in to now what he's saying, which is circumcision made without hands, something that only God can do in your hearts. You know what's mind-boggling about that? Back there in Deuteronomy, I believe it's Deuteronomy 10, the instruction from God, he says, circumcise your hearts. That was in the mind of God long before the implementation of the law of the outward parts. Think about that. Now, there are people who argue about covenants. 
and you know, I could get into covenantal nominism and all, a whole plethora of things regarding covenants, but the one important thing is there'll be, there'll be people who will argue and say, well, but circumcision was a sign and given as a, from generation to generation. Well, now this, what was a sign, which was given in actuality as a sign that actually became a shadow and a type, becomes a reality in Christ, that Christ can do something to our inward person that the outward markings and outward cuttings could never do. So once more, Paul's bringing them back. Come back to Christ. Come back to Christ. Come back to Christ. And if we are not going to at least glean one important message from these verses, it's just that. The reason why we are in the state we're in Lord knows I have been repeating myself for a long time. We are no longer coming back to Christ. Somebody said to me about two weeks ago, do you think God has taken his hand off this country? I don't know. I'm not God. I can only tell you what it looks like to me. And what it looks like to me is it looks like the bulk of our society doesn't care about God. The bulk of our society doesn't care about morality the bulk of our society wants what it wants and wants to do it the way it wants to do it, and that's what the Bible defines as sin, wanting your way, not God's way. So what we have in, these, in the second chapter is kind of brilliant. After Paul has finished telling us the relationship of Jesus Christ as creator, as the one in whom all things exist, consist, and are for, after he tells us all that, then he says, in him, in the incarnate, in this one, dwells. And that is an ongoing, not just in the present, but as ongoing, every part, every nature, every dimension of the deity. So when we pray, when we ask for things, you know, it's why the Bible says, Pray and ask with faith, don't, nothing wavering, and there's a reason for that. If he possesses all of this, then he's able not only to hear, but to grant. And I've said, one of the passages I have quoted for many years, Matthew 6, which is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There is the beginning of all things. If a person is really seeking the kingdom of God and desiring then they're going to be looking to all the fullness that is in him. If you're not looking for the kingdom of God, but you, you may think you're looking for the kingdom of God, but actually what you're looking for is something to make you feel good about yourself, then you're not looking for Jesus Christ, and you're certainly not looking for his church. Now, that's not to say that we're a people who are uh, abasing ourselves or we're, we, our whole nature is to, to be against uh, the self, but rather... Our whole nature is looking unto him, as I've said, Jesus of Nazareth, the image of the invisible God, the creator of the universe and sustainer. So what more do I or what more do you need? Or how about these Colossians? How could they have even thought of adding anything else? And I ask you that now. How could you think of adding anything else? And this is where I think boredom over the centuries has kicked in. You know, as I, as I looked at all the things that have crept into the church, I kept asking myself, why, why? Why do we do this, and why do we do that? And let's just talk about this. I, I mentioned New Age because I believe between New Age and legalism, these are the two things that have killed the modern church. Legalism has its own, uh, and he'll address that in here. Legalism has its own brand of what I'd call dastardly impact on the believer. But the New Age stuff, it's all the same. I think this is, this is the answer. Verses 9, 10, and 11, minimally, are the answer to that New Age problem. You're not going to find a combination smorgasbord. Like we know, I have a, a little bit of Christ over here, and I got a little bit of Buddha. You know, I, I like the part of you know, Buddha's calm, and he's the enlightened one. I like that part. And supposedly, uh, if I'm looking to Muhammad and Islam, maybe I'm looking for uh, some grooved-in pattern of prayer that I, I can adhere to. I don't know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kind of pulling things out of the air here to say the bottom line is for the believer. This is why we're called Christians, followers of Christ, little Christ. So what's the disconnect then? What has happened to the church? 
how do we get back? And I'm, I'm, I'm including us here. I'm not saying, you know, if I, if I excluded us, I'd be like that one that said, I thank my God I'm not like that guy over there, right? <laughs> I'm including us. I'm not saying we're the worst offenders, but I think any part is an offense to God. The prophet Jeremiah nailed this one when he said, my people have committed two evils. I don't know if you are familiar with what he says. They've forsaken me, the fountain of the living word. And what else? They have hewn themselves cisterns. That is what today's church has done, forsaken the living God and made a religion that they can find palatable and acceptable to themselves. What a radical idea if in today's society we could have a real reformation, not a reformation of Protestants or reformation of Catholics, if we could have a reformation where people actually said, we need to get back to the core tenets, not the tenets that were added by this one, that one, and the other one, the core tenets of this book. We need to get back to the simplicity and also the difficulty of the life of faith. We need to get back to understanding that exactly what Paul says, everything that I need as a Christian, I find in Christ. The church needs to get back to this book. How many people do I meet every single week? They don't read the Bible. They don't even know what's in it. And you know what? They'll have the audacity to say, well, you said thus and so, and I'm not really sure that that's true. <laughs> okay, then. Suit yourself. I'm, listen, I've never said, I've said, check me out. But this is the problem of ignorance. So, what can I, what more can I leave you with from this passage without going too far? A couple of things. I want you to circle in verse 9, and I'll use a different color. I want you to circle in verse 9, in him. That's in verse 9. I want you to circle in verse 10, in him. And then, if you keep going down, you're going to see two things. Verse 11 says, in whom also which is referring back to Christ, buried with him. And as you go through, you begin to see, in fact, if you went back to the start of the second chapter, you'd find more in hymns. Walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him. So can you see what Paul is doing here? He's not saying, hey, you're all going to hell in a handbasket now because you did this thing. He's directing them in him, in him. Look, this way, the arrow to your salvation, in him all that you need in him, this direction, in him, walk in him. You don't need to be walking in Jesus plus something else. So I love the fact that the clarity with which he is giving the correction is not one of a hammer over the head, but rather pointing in a direction. And that direction is pointing to Christ. Now, let me read on for a little bit because I wanted to read from 9 to 15. I read verse 11 already. Let me read it again. Whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And lastly, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let me just do this because it's right there. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat and drink in respect of a holiday, the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. So this whole chapter is a redirection. And if I had one prayer, one wish, one desire, and God could grant it right now, it would be that as many people 
who are listening to me, who have maybe, this will be the only time, the only one occasion they listen. I'm begging you to just look at what it is you're calling Christianity and understand if it is Christ-centered and you're looking unto him and he's the one, he is the center and the epicenter of everything, then fine. But I'm also asking you that if you're your celebrations of ceremonies, and we'll call them auxiliary functions, secondary type things that, that are not making Christ center. I'm asking you to reconsider what you're calling Christianity as nothing more than substitutions for what's lacking. And the lacking comes, takes me right back to the text, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the deity bodily. That means everything you need, friend. Everything you need. If if somebody listening to me today says, well, my problem is I need wisdom. I need need guidance in the Word. Then that's what you ought to be asking. And I can tell you one thing. When you ask God according to His Word, you know, there's lots of things we ask that are not according to His Word. People say, God didn't answer my prayers. Well, maybe you're you're not looking at what you're asking for. The Bible clearly says, remember out of Psalm 37, if you are basically asking the Lord to give you the delight of your heart, and it's, we'll call it assumed, or or we presuppose the delight of your heart is the Lord, then the Lord will give you the Lord. It's always what we desire. A lot of times we're asking for things, remember back there in Matthew 6, 33, seeking the kingdom first, and all these other things will be added to you. Which is the order you started in? Were you looking for all the other things and then maybe possibly trying to stumble upon the kingdom of God? Are we looking for the kingdom of God first and then all these other things to be added? And the other things are the things he knows you need for the trip, not the things necessarily you want. So when we clarify it like that, it becomes pretty plain. God is not only able to supply all of our need, but it's all there most of the time, the problem is we don't ask or we don't, we're not even clear what we're asking or what we should even ask for. So I'm leaving you with this thought today, and especially for my listeners out there who are not so well-versed in the Bible, and you may be part of that faction of people who's so entrenched in the baggage of the church and its traditions, you can't even recognize what is or what isn't. I really beg you, Whatever your questions are, and these are things that can be answered very simply, you know, whether you're listening to me or you go online and you try and find the answers there, but I've told you, you look for the origins of things that started in the church and you realize, how did this happen? How did we get, how did we get the people, as I mentioned last week, for example, the father of prosperity that then trickled down to a person like Oral Roberts, who became really the mastermind of marketing and Christian prosperity during the 70s, 80s, and a part of the 90s that basically made an imprint that all Protestant churches basically had to pattern after. If you didn't follow that pattern, how could you make ends meet? Because it couldn't possibly be that all the fullness of the deity dwells in him who's able to do all that we need instead of adding these human uh, inventions because we think God couldn't... You see how insulting that is? God couldn't possibly know it's... Well, whose church is it, friends? Whose church is it? If it's his church, then he knows what his church needs. Now, I can stand here and I can say, we need this and we need that, but he knows. So when I am telling you today, especially as I said, those folks maybe not so well-versed in the word, find the epicenter in your faith as Christ. Look to him and examine. There's no, there's no crime in this. I'm talking to my Catholic friends. I'm talking to my Protestant friends. Anyone out there, examine why you do what you do. Somebody said to me, well, you, you didn't talk about foot washing. You know what? Think about it. What was the point of foot washing? It was to show that the Lord of glory condescended. He came down to the, to the lowness of man to serve him. And people have taken that message to mean that, yes, we are to serve one another, but it's not an imitation of Christ a la Thomas Akempis. It is walking in him. That walking in him brings me to certain, we'll call them concepts of the Bible, like foot washing. Foot washing to me becomes a representation of what 
fellow Christians are to be to one another. Servants. Haven't I said? Sunergois is the Greek word. Fellow servants, fellow laborers. I've called you that. This is the missing thing. We, we take the foot washing and we make it into this grand ceremony and then we make it into a... Oh boy, I almost said it. We make it into a spectacle where everyone, come, come on, come on, come and see the show while the, the white-vested one will bow down and do the foot washing deal right here. I feel like Dallas Reigns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't live locally, it don't matter. Forget that comment. My point is, it's become a spectacle. It's become more of a show. It's become, look at how humble I am versus, you know what true servitude is? I do it whether you're looking or not. I do whatever it is I do if there's nobody here. That servitude for the right reason. When I start doing it and make a spectacle, isn't that what Jesus talks about and against in Matthew 6? Don't make it a theater. Don't make it a spectacle. Don't do it for others when you're supposed to be doing it for him. So the thought here is keep your focus on Christ. And even though this message maybe has a lot of ends that will dovetail into next week, the one thing I can tell you unequivocally It is time for the Church of Jesus Christ to try and reform itself. I'm asking for me. I'm asking for you. I'm asking for the sake of what may or may not be the future of Christendom. If people don't get serious and try to get back to some middle point, you know, I talked to you about fundamentalism, which swung the pendulum all the other way, and you've got the liberals going this way. What about what's right in the middle? And it's about time we get back to that middle point. The middle point is right where Christ is. That's where I want to be, and that's where I pray you want to be too. We'll pick this up again next week because I have much more to say, but I don't want to start opening up these other subjects because it will be interesting to see where we go. But for right now, stay focused, friends. He's the one that you focus on. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com. 